Part 4, The Dark Heart Chapter 1, Sinista Ion Noto Who would have thought the emperor to be a most generous man? I smiled as I read a copy of the letter I was about to deliver to Queen Marcella Benilda. A letter was signed by none other than her son, Emperor McQuinn Storm Aaron. It would cause many conversations in Achaea, one that I was sure would spread quickly like a forest fire in summer. I was inside my room waiting for Rodora Tulin to come back, hoping she had some great news to share with me. Canella became even more crowded, especially after the citizens learned about the trespass into the palace yard a few days ago. The ghosts had fought against the palace guards. And not only that, the emperor had fallen. And war dogs, those big mutts trained by the palace to defend the empire, had gone crazy and fought against the soldiers. Even the horses sided with the ghosts when none of them obeyed their master's instructions to ride hard after the ghosts. All of us were still astounded at the turn of events, and some blamed it on the possibility that the ghosts possessed some sort of witchcraft. These events in the mouths of travelers gave way to different versions of gossip, gossip that kept drawing in the mercenaries to Canella. It was a pity that the emperor was still in his chambers unwell. Soloran would tend to him, and so would Amaya, but nothing more could be expected from him now, which I believed was a good chance to show the emperor the kind of support he was getting from me. I would rally my men to Amer, deliver the letter to the queen, and set to finding the boy again. This time, as the emperor had instructed, I would kill the boy. Although, I still preferred handing the boy to the emperor alive. Somebody knocked on my door before it opened slightly, and the face of one of my men showed through the gap. General, Rodora is here, he said. Let her in, I said without moving from my chair. Rodora's figure came in. Her clothes fit snugly to her waist and chest. It was odd that I did not notice this before. I beamed at her. Inside my head, I was kissing her. What news have you got? I asked. Rodora sat first before answering. Her eyes studied me. We have to go back where we came from if you want to capture the boy, she said. Her eyes were glinting in the darkness. Where is he? The soldiers found tracks towards Sinista. I doubled over, laughing. I shook my head. No, they won't. What did I say that you found so hilarious? Rodora asked indignantly. I was still shaking from laughter. Not even my soldiers would go there, I said. If you were pursued by soldiers, and there was no other place to go, wouldn't you go there too? Assume that you were a mere lad. What would you have done, Ion? She asked. I stopped laughing and considered. Rodora had a valid point there. But a place riddled by beasts? It was unthinkable. Not to discredit you as you always have brought me useful information. But this is. It doesn't add up, I said. He's a boy. Who doesn't know geography? But who wouldn't want to face the beasts? Except he couldn't have known about the hubbubs residing there. Even so. I yelled. He would be mindlessly reckless if he had done so. Or it could be a trick to lure us there to get killed by beasts. Does anything frighten you, my good general? Rodora asked. She knew how to push my buttons. I glared at her. Nothing, I said. Then, listen to me and believe me. I have sent soldiers to Sinista, and I instructed them to send word should they find anything useful, she paused as she handed me a scroll. And this is the first of the many messages I got since then. I took the scroll she handed me. It was tiny, only a quarter of my thumb thick. When I opened it, there was nothing much to read. But when my gaze fell upon the words, I knew Rodora was telling me the truth. Assemble my men. Tell them we're leaving tomorrow, I said. A small smile crossed her face. Why tomorrow when we can do it now? Your men stand ready. I stared at her, wondering why I had never thought before that she could be helpful to me. Her loyalty was unnerving. I stood up and walked to her side, and when I was in front of her, I grabbed her hand and pulled her to stand up before me. I stared into her eyes, drowning in them. Because, I said, there is still much more we can do tonight. Then, I kissed her. 
Tomorrow, we will go to Sinista. The Swordless Swordsman I looked at Piper and Kino on the horse. They were riding slowly so I could catch up with them on foot. Still burning up? I asked. Piper nodded. I'm worried about him. Do you think we'll ever find a healer nearby? I thought about it. Canela would definitely have healers, but most Canellans were there in the Akeen Wine Festival, and if they recognized Kino, I doubt any among them would help us. Worse, any of them could pretend to take us in, only for us to find out later that we are being handed over to the Emperor's men. I don't think we can risk that. You're a Niven. You should know about herbs that could help out, I said. If I had spent my time picking out shrubs, maybe I would, she said forlornly. Would you like to ride with Kino? I'm tired of supporting him. Besides, his back against my body burns me up too. He's getting freakishly hot. Hmm, all right. Piper stopped the horse, and I climbed up. Piper moved down, and Kino's back was immediately pressed against my chest like a lifeless sack. Whoa! He's way too hot. I said worriedly. Maybe we need to dip him in a pond. Douse him with water. That could work, Piper said. Only there's no water around. Let's get back to the riverbank. It shouldn't be so far away. Then, let's go, she said. I pulled at the horse's reins to the left. If Kino's fever did not break, I wonder what would happen to him. Arden? Yes. Is Kino dying? Piper's eyes were moist with unshed tears. I mean, I didn't hold him close because I didn't want to feel that he was slowly slipping away. Is he? Tell me he's not. Kino's body felt like molten lava? At least that's how hot I imagined lava from a volcano must feel like. I was worried too, but I could not let Piper know. He has a fever and a festering wound, I said. This is common. Quila used to have infections, I stopped because I could not go through with a lie. I shook my head and caught Piper's eyes. I don't know. I hope he pulls through it, but I honestly don't know. Piper looked away, her shoulders hunched, and walked as though she was carrying the world's weight. There are other things we need to worry about. We did rescue Kino, and he should be a priority, but Piper and I hadn't eaten any decent meal in days. And if we were to survive, we need some nourishment. While you're down there, do you reckon you could find something to eat? Mushrooms, maybe? I asked. Yeah. It's like our luck to chance upon mushrooms. Sinista still gives me the creeps, but it's better in the morning with the light seeping through the canopy of trees, although I would not say it felt safer. A slight movement caught my eye right in front of us. Did you see that? I asked. Piper stopped so suddenly and veiled herself with invisibility. Not hobbubs again. She said. I don't think so. Hobbubs are never discreet, I said. Observe. That tree in front of us. I could swear something moved over there. We waited for movement, but the tree was still the way it should be. You're tired, Piper said, that you're beginning to see things. Then, she stopped talking as a movement, insignificant as it was, caught our eyes. I made myself and Kino invisible. Only the horse could be seen now. Do you think we should come after it? Piper asked. No. It could be another person lost in Sinista. We should help it. It isn't safe, I said. Piper turned visible again. Piper. Hide. I said in frustration but she had already started running towards the tree. She was scrutinizing it, curiosity etched on her face. What are you? Who are you? Show yourself, she coaxed. Piper. I yelled at her. She could be so frustrating sometimes. As stubborn as Quila was. Get back here. We don't need a diversion. We have enough on our hands. Piper jumped backward, and she fell to the ground, yelping? Dear gods! What could it be now? I kicked at the horse to come closer to her. Piper's eyes were so wide that I had to fight the urge to laugh at her. 
then, my gaze fell upon a man who did not look quite like a man. His body was covered with something dark like he'd sunk into the mud and left the mud to cake. What are you? I asked in equal fascination. He was, he looked the way Kino did when he tested his power. The tall, dark man with skin like a tree's trunk watched us. I'm a tree runner. A tree runner? Piper gasped. I never knew you still existed. I felt relief flooding my chest. Tree runners were delicate men no matter how odd they looked. Or at least that's what the story said. And, if I remember correctly from Quila's stories, they protected the secret of the last great black egg. Were you spying on us? Piper asked. I wanted to kick Piper for asking a question that seemed trivial compared to the location of the last great black egg of the dragon. The man laughed jovially. I might have. Why? Piper asked. I was about to join the conversation and demand knowledge about the last great black egg, but I was confused when the tree runner responded to Piper's question, you have one of us with you. What are you talking about? I asked, losing all thoughts about the last great black egg. The boy. He's a tree runner too, he replied. Oh, no, no. He isn't, I protested. The man looked confused. But I saw him. He was like us. When you were fighting the hobbubs, we saw, he said. I felt the blood drain out of my face. You saw us and decided not to help? The man stirred. It was not. I could not. Not after we had already helped someone else, and the other tree runners told us to keep away from humans. It's just not our way. That's crazy. We were dying out there, and you stood there watching us. I said, anger coating my voice. I could not believe that some people, if ever they were, would be so heartless to let Habub slaughter us. If it helps, I was standing nearby. If you had been on the verge of losing, I would have helped. What a relief. I said sarcastically. At least now I know we wouldn't have died. I was flushing all over. And what are you doing here approaching us now, huh? Won't the other tree runners be mad at you for getting this close to humans? I bellowed. No, he said in a monotone. And why is that? Because you have one of us. We have to take him away. Oh no, you don't. I yelled. I must have yelled directly into Kino's ears because he stirred. Wait, Piper said. I had forgotten she was standing right beside me. You said you met someone else here? She said here as though it was ridiculous. I gaped at the tree runner. They were traveling here when they were attacked. They? Piper asked. The tree runner observed her, perhaps wondering if he had said something wrong. Yes. There was a woman with four younglings traveling with her. I counted. There's Mayo, Quila, Goami, Miro. Four. And Nia. They were here. I did not know if I should be glad or scared. When was that? I asked. I realized that I was holding my breath. About a couple of days ago, he said. Piper, they're here. I said. Piper's smile was as wide as mine. What are we waiting for? Where are they? I asked the tree runner. Still here in Sinista, I'm afraid. Anyone unfamiliar with this place could get lost here for months without them realizing it, the tree runner said. Could you tell us which direction they took? The tree runner's eyes squinted. Why? Why the sudden interest in those humans? Because they are our friends, I said. Then, give me the boy, the tree runner said. What? He's not one of you, I said. Look at him. Does he look like he's growing bark all over his body? I saw. Maybe he's not yet accustomed to his power. We need to train him, the tree runner argued. No way. I'm not giving you our friend. He's sick. He could be dying, I said. Please. Help us. We need to find our friends soon. But when you find them, will you give me the boy? He asked. I will guide you to them, 
but only if you promise to trade information for the boy. I froze. This tree runner would not take no for an answer. Are you going to tell me where you hid the last great black egg if I give Kino to you? If yes, then maybe I will give him to you. But not before you lead us to our other friends. No, you can't trade Kino for the black egg regardless of what that egg can do. Piper shouted. Her eyes were glaring at me, and she had her fists clenched. It's the last great black egg. It means a dragon. The last dragon. I argued although I knew I was unreasonable this time. You have my word, the tree runner interjected. I turned to stare at the tree runner in surprise. You would tell me? The tree runner nodded slowly. So, you mean to tell me there's really a dragon's egg? I asked, still astounded. My eyes fell on Kino, and suddenly, a deep sense of guilt washed over me for even thinking about handing our friend to the tree runner. I'm sorry, but I can't, I looked at Kino. I didn't mean to trade him for an egg. Piper was right. Regardless of what that egg would mean for us, it did not seem right. If you do not agree to it, I will follow you, the tree runner said as though it was a threat. It doesn't matter. I won't hand Kino to you, I said with finality. Piper looked satisfied, although she still seemed to be glowering at me. The tree runner walked towards us. Even as I sat on a saddle, the tree runner towered over me. He beamed as he extended his hand to me. I admire your loyalty. Perhaps it is just right to offer you my service for proving a loyal friend to one of my kind. Kino's not one of you, I argued. The tree runner's hand was still extended to me, and it did not seem like he would retract it. I rolled my eyes as I took his hand and shook it. It felt grainy, like a hundred calluses riddled his hand. Piper was still glaring at me but with a hint of approval this time. Best to find Quila now. I tipped my hat at Piper and winked at her. Come on. It's time to find them, I said. Hope warmed my chest that with the tree runner's assistance, everything would turn out all right. Then, I smiled as I remembered that the tree runner admitted to knowing the secret about the last great black egg. Now all I had to do was force him to tell me where it was. Quila would be so excited. Dogen Ronda they're gone. I could not believe it. Kino and Piper were gone from Amer, and I could not help them out. I sucked at tailing after the children. What would Master Andoni say about this blatant failure? His daughter was still loose upon the cruel world, and I am here running away from palace soldiers. And there was no way I could disguise myself. These soldiers who were looking for me knew me down to my toenails. If I had not spent days with them at the bars and stables drinking and playing cards, maybe they would not remember my face. Bah. That's ridiculous. Anybody who saw my face would not forget it, and I say this without a speck of arrogance. I mean, because I look like a monster, who would ever forget my face? In some ways, it was a gift and a curse. Nah. Just a curse, I think. But something good had happened. I learned that my power was not limited to growing flowers. I could also make vines which was quite an improvement. How would I ever find the children? Soft footsteps trailed after me. Manny Ren? I asked. Is it you? There's no news about where the children went. They vanished into thin air, Manny Ren replied. They'd vanish in thin air. Piper's a niven like you, I said and she can make Kino invisible too. The soldiers have returned to the palace. All of them were concerned about how the next events would play out. If the general. What general? I asked. General Ion Noto. The one who captured the boy, he said. I paled. General Ion Noto was the one who captured Kino? I asked. Bad luck. It should have been anyone but him. He had a reputation for being ruthless to the point that the soldiers believed he was the devil incarnate. Sometimes, he made decisions that were so vile it would put the emperor to shame. Frayed so, Maniren answered. Do you know him? Know him? I abhor him. I yelled, then I caught myself and made my voice softer. 
he is a bad man. Bad? That's all you can say? He likes killing people. But before he does, he tortures them first. Have you heard about the death of the famous 20? That was him who did that. He captured them and tied them up together. He gouged one eye socket out of each man, replacing the eye of the one beside him. Then, the other eye he took out and boiled them, and when they were hungry, fed it to them. That's vile. Manny Ren burst out. You don't say. And a lot more. If he had his hands on Kino, I wonder what he did to the poor boy. Manny Ren remained silent. The general went to Canela, fuming that the boy had escaped. Who do you think did it? I have no idea, but it could be one of his friends. I don't know how they managed to pull it off, I said thoughtfully. But I have to admit that Piper has some incredible wits. She is a handful, Manny Ren admitted. When we find them, we must bring them back to Nivadan immediately. Laren would be worried. Andoni, well, he has a lot on his mind. I don't want Piper's flight to worry him too. The problem was that I did not know where they went. Akio was a massive world, and if there were no clues left behind, then the task of searching for someone was like looking for one fish in the ocean. Soft footsteps hurriedly walked towards us. Manny Ren, I can feel them, one of the Niven said. The voice was gravelly, and I could only pin that voice to Doral. What? Tree runners, Doral answered. Are you certain? I asked. Yes. We were inside the forest, a sinister place that was. We felt as though eyes were following us although we were invisible. But how could you know they were the tree runners? I asked. We have a close affiliation, Manny Ren said. They used to build our tree houses for us before the emperor banished them. What do we do now? Should we find another route? Doral asked. I guess that's the best way to go about it. But if tree runners were here, then it only means this place is. Sinista, I said. Right. Where hobbubs and other beasts thrive. Even with my bulk, I mentally shivered at the thought of facing hobbubs. Then, we run around it. I don't want to mess up with the beasts, Manny Ren said. Wait, I said. How far before we cross to Sinista? A mile walk, Doral answered. We must get there. If there are tree runners, maybe they can help us, I said. I remembered meeting them once. My chest tightened as I remembered having to bury Lamare. And right after that, I made flowers grow all around her burial ground. When I had finished, tree runners came out of hiding. They called me little brother. Manny Ren seemed confused, but he tailed after me as we walked towards Sinista. There were giant trees that looked older than Akia inside the forest. No wonder no one bothered to pass through it. But today, this could help me out in some way. I hoped. Maybe. I entered the border and felt a surge of nausea penetrate my being. It was like an oil slick had permeated my body. The vileness was horrible, but there was no way I would go out without trying first what I had in mind. I could feel the Niven surrounding me, perhaps wondering why I insisted on being here. I knelt and touched the ground before closing my eyes. Then, one by one, the field started sprouting flowers, all kinds of them. I heard the Nibbins gasp in amazement, and at the same time, I also heard a few of them chuckling. They never knew what my power was. They only assumed that it was my strength. I had never corrected them. When the ground was covered with flowers as far as my eyesight could reach, I stood up and waited. If there were tree runners here, they would approach me. They would sense my power and feel an affinity. The Nibbins stood silently behind me, waiting for what would happen next. But nothing happened. Nobody approached us. Shouldn't we be leaving now? Manny Ren asked. No. Not yet, I said. We have to wait. He fell silent again, and we all waited. The trees started moving as though they were living. I stood there, pinned to the ground, mesmerized at what was unfolding before my eyes. Then, as though the trunks of the trees split, men emerged from them. 
the tree runners stood right in front of us. What took you so long, brothers? I asked. There are those with you who hide, a tree runner said. The tree runners could sense the Nivens, the way the Nivens sensed them. Maniren, show yourself. Tell the other Nivens to show themselves too. One by one, the Nivens' bodies appeared behind me. Why did you come to us, little brother? A tree runner asked. I need your help, I said. I am looking for my friends. It is not in our nature to mingle with your kind, at least, not anymore. But then, he paused and looked at the other Nivens before adding, perhaps we can offer some kind of assistance. Gods, I hoped I would find the children now. Mayo Kolo. Don't you ever get tired? I asked Quila. My stomach was growling again, and I looked up at the sky and noted the sun was directly above us. It was already midday, and we hadn't stopped to eat, much less look for food. I'm hungry and tired, Quila replied. But you happen to complain more. I frowned. What's the use of our tongues if we don't get to use them for complaining, I said. Gossiping? Quila jested, and I groaned in annoyance. Do you know we've been going around in circles in this eerie place? How long has it been? I think we're approaching a fortnight, and we're still inside this crazy forest. We're lucky we haven't encountered any more hobbubs. Ha! If we encounter more of them, I'll climb a tree. I have thought about it. Hobbubs don't seem like they could climb a tree, so I'll be safe up in one, I said. Why? Did you read that in one of your books back in school? I shrugged. Not really. No. Then, let's hope we don't get the chance to find out if your theory is true. Quila's such a bubble popper. Sometimes I disliked her as much as I hated Miro, although I would say it was on a different level. I did not like Miro because he looked crazy and seemed to capitalize on his incapacity to lure people to do everything to his liking. Kick at the horse harder, I urged Quila, and we kicked together. The horse galloped and caught up with Mistress Lamare's horse. We're going in circles, I said when Mistress Lamare was close. Her forehead was creased in worry. I noticed, she said. This place is playing tricks on us. Can't we try a different route? I asked. Gomi looked scared. The last time I checked, all we did was head in a straight direction. We never took a turn, yet we're still here confined in Sinista. Quila nodded vigorously. If Piper were here, I think she would have thought of something to get out of this curse, I said. Stop talking about curses, Quila said. Why? Don't you feel it? The eyes are tearing at our bodies like they have been watching us all along. It could be the stupid tree runners for all I care or the hobbubs. Or some other fancy beast I used to only read in books. I said. Your imagination is freaking us out. Quila said. Enough. Mistress Lamare said. Her face looked concerned and thoughtful, as though she was thinking of a way to get us out of here. The river. She said. The river flows in a direction towards the ocean. It should bring us out of this place and into another land. I nodded. That should do it. We took a turn and headed for the river, but it was impossible to figure out where the river was. The sounds were so muted I thought the silence would deafen me. I'm exhausted, I said. Can't we rest for a while? Nothing will dare attack us in broad daylight. You complain too much. I told you to shut it, Quila said. We must get to the river fast. The sooner we get there, the more confident I would be that we could get out of this crowded place. It was the first time I ever heard Quila say something nasty. Craddy, huh? I said, suppressing a smile. So, it's getting on your nerves too. Quila shivered. It does. I'm scared to death. Even if we rest here, I doubt if I could fall into a deep sleep. She was right, so I remained silent and followed Mistress Lamare's horse. Then, we heard the sound of rushing water. It could only be the river. Quila glanced back at me. 
Her eyes twinkled, and her cheeks were pink from staying long hours under the sun. I think we'll find our way to Canela now, she said happily. Piper San Diego I glanced at the tree runner. Everything I heard about the tree runners was right, they're gentle creatures, soft-spoken, and towered humans. Yet, at times, I would catch him scowling at me. Perhaps Sinista had corrupted him somehow. I was surprised to find out that their skin was like the bark of trees. We've been following the tree runner for a while already, and every step we took brought us closer to reuniting with our group. This was surreal but in a good way. Part of me was looking forward to the reunion, so I could return to Nivadin with Mayo and Kino. However, another part of me was reluctant to be reunited for fear that I would have to make a thousand sandals as punishment for running away. But then, the reward was that I would see my father and mother again. I wished we could go home soon. The tree runner halted in front of us. What is it? Arden asked. Trouble, he said. What kind of trouble? Habubs? I asked. Until now, I was unsure if we could trust the tree runners. No. Men. Riding horses, said the tree runner. He looked flustered. No one has dared cross Sinista in the past. Then in weeks, men have been coming in and out of this place. Well, mostly coming in as none among you has managed to get out yet. I chilled. It was like he was cursing us to a life in this creepy place. How do you manage to stay here? This place is horrible. I said. It wasn't a choice, little one, he answered. Make haste. He turned to the left and all but ran. Arden Kino and I followed him. We turned invisible so that no one could see us as we passed. The twins. I wondered how they couldn't figure out that the only way out of Sinista was to follow the river. Sometimes, they could be so slow. And now, I could hear the river. We were near it, and I could not wait to find Arden. The scent of the air was different when we reached the riverbank. It was as though we were in a different place. Everybody rejoiced that we had water and each had gone to refill their canteens. Mama was leaning over and washing herself up. Quila and that hateful Mayo were also bathing. They should have known that we could not stay long here. Danger spawns from everywhere? I drank from my canteen greedily and refilled it before flopping to the ground, watching them. There's a boat. Quila shouted. They stood up. Mama remained calm. Her hand raised over her eyes as she watched the boat approaching us. Let's go with them. Mayo said. It will get us out of here faster. We have gold coins left, don't we? I wanted to hit Mayo on his head. He was all conceit, thinking about nothing but the pleasures in life and how to make things easy for him. He eats like a pig and complains a lot. No one should be allowed to be friends with his lot. The boat slowed down as it approached us. By this time, everyone was waving their hands to make it stop. I stood up and walked over to them. Mama's face had gone pale when she recognized who was riding the boat. Master Damien? She asked in a stutter. Master Damien motioned for his men to lower the planks. After they did, they climbed down to meet us. My lady, he said, sounding worried. What are you doing here? Mama asked. Master Damien looked worried. We never got that far away. I'm surprised to find you here. Haven't you gone away the way you should? To a mare, if I recall correctly. Mama pursed her lips and shook her head. We were not successful in leaving the place. Sinista, she said, shivering, is an evil place. It never let us out of its confines. Master Damien paled. Do you mean to say that you've been here since that time we left you? Mama nodded. We thought, we thought the river could help us out. I mean, if we follow the river's flow into the seas, we'll find ourselves safely into the edge of another land. But you. I am so sorry, my lady, Master Damien said. But that seems to be a remote possibility. My men are tired from rowing, our coals are all but gone we are all hungry, and everyone is sick, dreaming of home. It seems like this place is playing tricks on us. Then, join us. 
Maybe our chance of leaving this place together will be better if we travel together. Master Damien considered. I am not certain. I will ask my crew. Then suddenly, the galloping of horses was heard all around us. In seconds, we found ourselves surrounded by Canellan soldiers bearing the palace's insignia. Now things were getting interesting. Ion Noto The sight that greeted us was a quaint one. A lady was talking to a boatman, and a boat was waiting on the bank. There were children gathered all around. Now I wondered why I brought with me a hundred of my men? But as my gaze fell upon them, I realized that the boy I wanted to capture wasn't here. We surrounded them, and they huddled closer together. I dismounted and started walking towards them. A fine day, my lady, I said, smiling broadly. It was indeed a beautiful day for me. The woman stiffened and studied me. General Ion Noto, I said and extended my hand. She extended her hand and gripped mine. It was such a firm grip for someone who looked so fragile. When my gaze fell upon her face again, I was mesmerized, and my tongue caught inside my mouth. Lamare, I said in disbelief. What did you say? She asked. Her eyes had gone wide. Lamare Amark, the royal scribe. I didn't expect to find you here, I said. But it's just as well. I will take you back to the emperor. My men started to move closer to us. No. She said. She looked scared, but she stared at me, leveling me. If your men dare to move a step closer, one of them will fall from the horse, dead. My eyebrows rose. I chuckled. That is not your power. What have you turned into? A witch? I said. From behind me, I heard sudden movements of someone choking. Cohen was twisting in his saddle, clutching at his chest. His hands fell limply to his sides before sliding down the horse and landing on the ground with a loud thump. Loud gasps filled the air, and even the horses felt the tension. They started to dance nervously. I stared at Lamare. What have you become? I asked in anger. One more word and another one will fall. Do not test my patience, General. Let us leave in peace, or all your men will die, she said. This time, her voice had grown more self-assured. There was still a tinge of nervousness that she couldn't shake off, but who would dare fight someone who could cause the death of someone without even touching the man? Her power was downright evil. I stood frozen to the spot. Give me the boy then, I said. What boy? Your son, I said. What was his name? She asked, her lips shaking. What was his name? I repeated in surprise. Don't play games with me, woman. Hand over the boy, and we will leave. Her shoulders stiffened. You will remember not to raise your voice on me, general, or you will find yourself in Sinista alone with your soldiers' corpses. I heard swords being unsheathed from my back. I raised my arms at my men. Don't, I said steely. We will obey and leave you in peace. I turned away, but before I did, I studied all their faces, taking with me a mental image of who I would have to kill later on for shaming me today. These puny men would find death at the edge of my sword. By your leave, your highness, I said in mockery. Lamare's eyes did not leave my face. The air was so brittle it could have easily shattered. Not one among my men had dared to stir. Take Cohen Ernato. I told my men. He will be buried in Canela, I said. Two soldiers jumped off their horses and gathered Cohen's dead body. They tied him to the horse. With one last look at them, I turned around, rage tearing at my chest that I had not been able to get what I wanted. From out of nowhere, men appeared. They were graying, like the ones we fought in Canela days ago. They appeared and vanished right before our eyes, throwing punches at us. My men unsheathed their swords and fought them, but we were no match to fight men who could vanish into thin air. I doubled over as strong hands gripped me from behind and pulled at me, dragging me from my horse. But no one is invincible to a sword, especially not when I was the one wielding it. In a quick motion, 
I unsheathed my sword and slashed at the man I presumed could have been standing before me. Blood sprayed towards me, which meant I had been correct with my estimation. All around me, the soldiers were fighting against invisible men. But what caught me off guard was the ugly man wrestling with my men. He stood tall and bulky, and each time he swung his arms, men fell to the ground. Dogen Ronda, for the love of gods. Who would have thought I would find them all in this place? Several soldiers fought with him, but he was adept at his weapon. He was bleeding, yet his determination to kill my men was startling. I stood up and slashed my sword around me, hoping the invisible people would die. Rodora was fighting from behind me, her back against mine. Anyone who approached us would find himself dead. From the corner of my eye, Lamare and her companion scurried away, and then they stopped. For whatever reason that was, I did not care. I will attend to them in a while. I needed to get rid first of these stinking grey men. After I swung my sword in front of me several times, a man fell, bleeding all over. He would not see the light any more. Men surrounding us started to topple over and die. Some were wearing the palace's insignia, while others had nothing on but their loincloths. The Swordless Swordsman As the sounds of hooves got louder, I wondered where the tree runner was taking us. I paled when it dawned on me that we were not trying to get away from the commotion but were going right into the middle of the fighting. The tree runner stopped, its face a mask of hesitation as it watched soldiers fighting Nivens. Nivens, for the love of gods. How did this happen? What were they doing outside Nivetan? Has the world really gone crazy? I climbed down, and Kino stirred. His eyes fixed on me, and a small smile was plastered on his lips. Go back to sleep, chum, I said. Piper was kneeling beside Kino. What are you doing? Piper asked me. What do you think? You're not going to fight the soldiers, are you? I will fight them. These are our blood fighting them, and they're losing. I don't know how many are still alive. Can you see them? No, Piper said, tugging at my hand. Don't. Let's leave now. This tree runner has brought us to danger. Don't you see what he's playing at? He wants us dead so he can take Kino. No. He's not that, I argued. Tree runner, I said. Fight with us. The tree runner shook his head sadly. Apologies, lad, but this is a fight among men. I cannot dishonor myself by fighting this battle. It is yours to take, not mine. Well, I'll be damned. After hearing what the tree runner said, knowing I could not convince him even if I tried so many times, I tipped my hat and ran straight into the battlefield. Piper was left clutching Kino to her. Poor girl. I removed my sword from its scabbard before turning invisible, then I slashed at the first soldier I saw. I thrust the sword right through his stomach and twisted the blade, carving out his insides. He fell, clutching at his stomach, eyes wide with terror. His body sprayed blood as he fell to the ground. I should have felt satisfaction upon doing that, but no. Killing someone so others may live is wrong. A soldier slashed his blade, and it almost struck me. I was quick, so I jumped back, but another soldier was slashing his sword madly behind me. The blade cut through the small of my back, and I lost control of my power. My body showed, flickering in the dim light. I gripped the sword tighter and waited for the soldier's attack. Arden. Someone shouted. I looked sideways and saw Quila, and I was engulfed with a dozen different types of emotion. I tipped my hat at her and winked. Then, I turned my attention to the soldier in front of me. The soldier slid forward, testing me on a sword. I made myself invisible and stepped sideways in a flurry, then, pitying the soldier, flicked his hand with the blade of my sword. Where the edge touched his hand, blood flowed freely. He yelled in pain as he stared at his hand with missing fingers. He turned around in desperation, trying to find me. I showed myself when he was staring right through me and winked at him. I thrust the sword straight to his chest and pulled him closer, killing him instantly. Sorry, chum, I said. 
the small of my back started throbbing. I could feel the blood dripping down my legs, but the soldiers were so many and the Nivens few that I could not stop to tend my wound. I had to kill as many soldiers as I could. Arden. Quila kept on yelling. This way. I ignored Quila's pleas. I had to help my men. I swung my sword against another soldier, and he toppled down, blood gurgling out of his mouth. I braced myself into a fighting position, my stance firm, my arms ready to swing again, when I heard another voice I had been missing all these months. Arden. The voice shouted again. The sound of my name coming from Goemi's lips was heaven sent, and I could not make myself ignore her. I turned around and found myself gazing at Goemi, my beautiful Goemi. She was standing beside Quila, shouting my name repeatedly to make me stop fighting and run away with them. Beside them were Mayo, Nia, Miro, and a few men I did not recognize. I waved and smiled at Goemi. At that moment, a blade hit me on the shoulder, and I toppled over. Blood instantly soaked my right arm. I turned over and clutched my sword tightly. In the darkness, I could see my attacker very clearly. It was a soldier with an ugly scar on both cheeks. He swung his sword, and I lay there, still as a rock, waiting for the moment his blade would meet my sword. The soldier fell to the ground beside me in a loud thud. From behind him, Piper appeared. She had plunged a dagger into my opponent's back. Sorry for that, chum, I said to the fallen soldier. I groaned as the sting of my wound hit me. Come on, she said urgently. We have to go. I can't, I started to protest. I looked around us. For each Niven standing, ten soldiers could easily take him down. We can't win this battle, Arden. Let's run. We'll fight back, but I'm afraid it shouldn't be today, Piper said, her eyes pleading. I stood up and was overcome by dizziness. Pain shot from my shoulder down to my fingernails. See, you're not well enough. She scolded. Quila ran towards me and took my arm. Not so quickly, chum, I said. Or my arm might fall off. Quit joking, Quila hissed. And dear gods, I wish I were joking. I stared at my arm that, at this point, had been entirely covered with blood. The cut on my shoulder was so deep I think I could see the white of my bones coming out. My fingers had gone purplish so quickly. I knelt in front of me and vomited. Stubborn mischief, Quila muttered. Help us. She called out to Nia and the other men. I fell, no longer trusting myself to stand up. A flash of coldness swept my entire body, and my eyes rolled up. For a minute, I thought I had lost consciousness until arms gripped me. My arms throbbed painfully as I was put over a horse. Upon settling down, my groans were silenced as I felt Goemi's arms around me, her face close to mine. I wanted to hug her if I could, but my arms hung limply on the horse's sides. There were so many things I wanted to tell Goemi, but with the turmoil surrounding us, I was only able to ask her about the boy we were protecting from the Emperor. Kino, I croaked. Find him. Keep quiet. We're going to escape now, Goemi said. Her tears fell from her eyes in silent streams down to my face. Where have you been? I missed you so much. Stop crying. I'm not dying, I said in jest before winking at her. Don't worry about me. Go after Kino. Find him. He's too sick to walk. Bring the men, then I added, please. Goni nodded at high speed. Her hands brushed away her tears before rushing to Nia and the rest. My eyes blurred, and I thought I had fallen asleep until I felt movements from my back. I fought to open my eyes and saw Goemi straddling the horse I was on. She grabbed the reins and pulled at them. Hey, I said weakly. They'll take care of Kino. You don't have to worry about him now. I will ride with you, Goemi said earnestly. Go right in front, I said. I won't topple over. No. I have to watch over you, she said. She kicked at the horse, and we started galloping away. Mira will be furious, I whispered. Goemi shook her head. Under the moonlight, 
she looked so beautiful. It must have been hard for her to ride the horse with me leaning against her. I must have been heavy, and yet, she did not falter. Her determination made her even more beautiful, and I fell in love with her a dozen times over today. Do you know how often I wish to gaze upon your face like this? I said through the noise surrounding us. A small smile showed itself on Goemi's lips. It lingered for a moment before it slipped away. I want that, she said. I love you, have I not told you that? I said. Yes, you have. I heard it both times you said it to me. Her eyes remained focused on the road ahead. I smiled, staring up at her. She was a piece of wonder. I could not believe she heard me tell her I love you both times and did not say anything about it. I could not complain because love did not always have to be discussed. Sometimes, merely knowing the probability of love being reciprocated was enough. I could not take my eyes off her face, even from the angle I was gazing at her, she looked lovely. I wished we could spend forever together. Do you love me too? It was the wrong moment to ask her that, but I could not shake it off my head. I missed her so much, and I wanted to know. Shh, she said. We'll talk when all this is over. I smiled at her. It was a promise. We'll talk when all of this is over. It was a good promise. From behind us, soldiers started appearing. Goemi kicked at the horse, and we trotted faster, leaving the soldiers behind. But the soldiers kept trailing after us, throwing spears I did not know they had with them. Leave me behind, I urged her. No. She shouted. We're heavy. The horse can't carry us for long, I said. She shook her head vehemently. Never, she whispered. Hold on to the reins like this. And never let go, all right. Gomi said. I nodded, delirious but still very much awake. The world had started to blur as we galloped inside the forest. I felt a spear was right past my ear, and Goemi jerked. Hold tightly, my dear Arden, she said lovingly. Then, she pushed me so my face rested on the horse's mane. What are you doing? I asked in a stammer. Hold tight. I will find you, she said. She jumped off the horse. I did not know what had happened to her. All I heard was the sound of her body as she landed on the ground. I cursed myself for being so weak, for taking that blade with my shoulders, and for being unable to fight back. Before I passed out, I wondered when I would get to see Goemi pass up again. And what if it were never? A tear slid down my cheek. I was bouncing against the horse, my face slamming against its mane. And then, there was nothing. Mayo Kolo I found Kino resting against a tree. When I ran towards him, I noticed he was not stirring. No, not again. Is he sick again? How could he always be sick? It's like this whenever we are on the verge of fighting. Could it be his power? To get sick during a fight so he would not have to fight? I knew it was an absurd thought, but it was so coincidental. I tugged at Kino's head and pressed it closer to my chest but there was no way I could carry him, so I switched places. I put his right arm on my shoulder and winced as his dead weight made me stumble. I could not carry him. He was much too heavy. I glanced at the fighting several yards away and prayed no one would see us. Who could I call to help me with him? Dear gods! I was so scared. If one of those soldiers found us, we would be as good as dead. Could I heal Kino now? Would that wake him? Maybe I could do something about this fever. I closed my eyes and wrapped my arms around him. It was hard to concentrate when all I could hear were wails from the soldiers, nivens and metal clashing against metal. I jerked each time a man groaned, knowing it could be the last sound ever coming out of him. I wrapped my arms around my friend, pressed his face closer to my shoulder, and closed my eyes. It would get to me, the vileness that was in him. I traced where it was coming from. The stench was more than I could bear, and I felt my eyes welling with tears. It was painful, and it was scalding. There was no slimy poison cutting at Kino's body, 
but rather, a rotten something. I could not pinpoint it, but it had festered. A more revolting wound had grown on top of it. I removed the abominable coating eating at his injury, making it fester. It had stuck to his flesh, and I could feel sweat covering my body now like he shared his fever with me. I peeled the loathsome coating slowly because it would hurt both of us if I did it quickly. When it was done, I opened my eyes and doubled over beside Kino, gagging. It was the most dreadful thing I ever tasted, like it was made of pus and rotten food and already growing maggots. I shuddered and kept gagging until there was nothing left for me to vomit. I pressed my back against the tree and felt weak. But Kino looked better. My eyes slid from his face to his body, and I noticed that he had an ugly wound on his left leg. That wound could have been the source of the vileness in his body. It would get better now, I hoped. Kino's face looked healthier. It still had no color, but something made his cheeks glow. Maybe, it was a sign that he would get better. As I continued resting against the tree, I wondered how I would carry Kino now. Piper, I croaked. But she did not see me. She was busy putting daggers into someone else's back. I had never known she could fight like this. It was admirable, but I wish she'd glanced back. I felt so weak that I thought I was on the verge of passing out. Piper, I whispered again. But even to my ears, my voice was so faint that I doubted if she would ever hear me. Mia Passup I kept looking around for the children, but I only saw Quila. Goami and Mira were not to be found. And Arden, he was gone too. Mayo, where was he? If only I could find him, we could escape this somehow. The swords kept slashing around me, and I had to stay low so no one would find me. It still hurts me to know that I killed two soldiers. Not that I had any choice. Had I not done so, I would not have been standing now. My stomach heaved as I passed Master Damien. His limbs had been torn, and what was left of his face was only his chin. Every part of him was ripped as though it was a raging lunatic and not an honorable soldier that had killed him. I clutched at my stomach as it heaved. My eyes had gone watery, and I brushed away the tears. Not now when all I should be thinking about was an escape. Poor Master Damien. I brought him and his people to death. Quila ran towards me, panting. Let's go. She said. I nodded. Did you find them? Quila asked. I shook my head. They've got to be here somewhere, she said. I paled as I saw the blood covering the front of Quila's dress. She looked at me and shook her head. Oh no, this wasn't mine. It was from a soldier. Nasty one. Come on. She urged. She started running away from the commotion. Wait. She said. There's Piper. I searched for a horse, and when I saw one, I ran towards it. I quickly picked up a sword that I passed on the ground. I had better be ready in case somebody attacked me. I climbed up on the saddle. Get a horse, too, I shouted to Quila, who nodded at me. We were lucky the general was still out there fighting. These gray men were giving the soldiers a hard time. Quila came closer to me on a horse. They're here somewhere, she said. A small girl appeared before me, and I almost shrieked. Before I could say anything, she climbed up behind me and urged me to move. Let's take Kino. I kicked at the horse and trotted away. Somewhere deep in the forest, I saw two boys leaning against a tree. If they were both sleeping, how could we take them? Over there. Piper burst out a little too late because I had already spotted them. Quickly now, I said. I jumped off the horse and tried to carry the boy with dark brown hair. He stirred and opened his eyes. It's going to be all right, I said. Hold on to me. The boy obeyed, although I doubt if he understood anything I said. Put your foot up. Then, I pushed at him until he was seated on the saddle. Quila and I did the same with Mayo. Short as he was, he was heavy, and we had difficulty hauling him over to the saddle. But finally, we did it. I rode, and Quila did too. My stare met that of the little gray girl. Come on, ride with me, I said. She motioned to climb, but when she heard who's coming closer to us, she shook her head. Go! She yelled. Now! I'll take care of this. I'll find you. Before I could protest, 
she had vanished into thin air. Quila and I started writing like there was no tomorrow. Ion Noto Most of my men had fallen. Rodora was still up and fighting, but I wondered if we would ever get out of this alive. If I do not call my men to retreat now, there may be no one left standing on the battleground. I ground my teeth in frustration. It was not right to have to fight the grey men like this. These ghosts knew nothing but cowardice. How would we win against them if they flickered in and out of sight? One ghost could take twenty soldiers in minutes without sweating. I had to make a quick judgment call. Or else, my hundred men would all be gone in the next hour. Follow me. I shouted over the battlefield. One by one, the soldiers on foot rode their horses. Those who were already mounted turned and galloped away from the battlefield. We rode away, leaving the filthy ghosts. There would be no forgiveness for anyone who had fought against us tonight. All of them, the children, Gilgan Ronda, Lamar A. Amirk, and the pack of ghosts. We had killed only a handful, and the ones that mattered remained alive. And the boy wasn't with them. I groaned in frustration. Rodora rode beside me. She was silent, but I felt her sympathy. It singed me. The Twins I rode hard towards the fighting, oblivious to the throbbing of my face and scalp. This day would be over soon, and I could not wait for the promise of a better tomorrow. We would all be together again. I did not care if we kept hiding in Lundu or stayed here in Sinista as long as no one breaks us apart again. I was determined to rescue Mama and the others on the battlefield. Dear gods, please let them still be alive. Silhouettes of women riding horses passed beside me, and I squinted. Could it be Mama? And Quila? I could not be wrong. Those were they. My heart leapt in jubilation as I turned around and rode after them. The wind cut through my face causing my tears to shower over the land as I rode faster. Mama! I shouted. Mama! Mia looked back, relief flooding her face. Straight ahead. I yelled. Miro and Arden are safe. Quila looked back, and her worry seemed to vanish upon hearing Arden was safe. I kicked harder. Since my horse was carrying less load, I could overtake them in minutes. Follow me? I yelled before continuing to the path I told Miro to go to. The Swordless Swordsman The horse had stopped for some reason, and the rough mane piercing my face woke me up. I squinted at the dark sky and wondered how long I had been out. My entire body ached, and I felt woozy. I moved my right hand and groaned in pain. Then, I stared in horror and found the ground pooling with blood. No wonder I felt lightheaded. I had lost so much blood. I heard footsteps behind me, and I attempted to raise my head. It was the unruly hair that I first saw. I had been afraid that it was a hubbub. If one came to me now, I would not be able to fight it. I smiled at Miro. It was good to see him, although, at the back of my head, his presence sent me what I referred to as unnecessary fear. Fear because of the fact that he could kill me again. I convinced myself he would not because he was Goemi's twin, and no matter what his actions in the past were, he was still someone who probably did not intend anyone harm. His disability made it hard for him to control his actions. Help me, Miro, I said slowly. Miro regarded me closely. He stopped a few feet away from me before moving closer to inspect my wound. Ugly, huh? I said to him. Then, I chuckled so he would not be so scared. Nothing to worry about. Help me out of this horse, so I can wrap a bandage around it. I wished he understood me. For some reason, maybe he did. He walked over to me and pulled at my torso, his hands gripping me towards his back. I groaned because it ached to be dragged like this. Luckily, my feet had gone numb, so they were spared the pain. I let out a deep breath as Miro successfully carried me from the horse. He walked slowly towards a tree before stopping as though he did not know what to do. Get closer to the tree, I whispered against his ear. And then, move your back against it. I will be able to slide down. Miro cooperated and followed my instructions. 
as I slid between the tree and his back, I cried in pain as my wound pressed against a stump. My eyes watered, and I could not blink the tears back. When I sat down, Miro bent in front of me with his head rocking back and forth the way it did when he was thinking. Thank you, I said. Could you tear a portion of my clothes, please? A piece that's big enough to wrap around my shoulder. I need two, I paused, gathering breath, cover the wound. I glanced at my wound and was relieved to find that the bleeding had stopped. The big wound looked like a chunk of the flesh had been removed. The notion that part of my flesh was lying somewhere in the battleground of Sinista, probably with pests feasting on it now, made me grimace. I felt like vomiting. Miro held my head and pushed it slowly against the trunk. He bent down to rip part of my clothing. The sound filled my ears, and even that hurt me. Every part of me hurts. I opened my eyes and gazed at Miro. Don't be scared, chum, I said. Miro did not answer and continued grunting until he was able to tear part of my clothing. He moved towards my right side and started wrapping my wound with the cloth. Hey, I said, coughing out a laugh. I didn't know you could do that. Miro kept on wrapping the bandage around my wound, and I was touched by this gesture. I thought that with his condition, he would just drape the torn cloth over my shoulder. That would be enough protection from the insects. Maybe he did not understand the world at times, but I was only happy he seemed to do so right now. He kept covering my wound, and though the wound throbbed, the bandage stopped my right hand from numbing. I moved the fingers on my right hand and was pleased when I saw them stir. Blood had caked my fingernails. Don't worry, chum, I said. Everything's going to be all right. Those soldiers we fought back there, they're evil. They want to capture Kino. They want to kill all of us, and look at how it ended, huh? We're out here alive. You don't have to worry about Goami. She's a brave young lady. She'll come back to us. I tried to catch Miro's eyes, but it was impossible. He kept on looking downwards. I wanted to assure this young man that he would not be alone in the world. That Goami, Nia, and all our friends would make it through this. He must have been so scared, and my heart went to him. I put my left hand over his and squeezed it. Listen, it's going to be all right, I said. He did not move. He kept on rocking. If my shoulder had not hurt, I would have given him a hug. You know what's beautiful about the night? I told him, trying to pass the time. It is the only time that Akeens can see the stars. The gods created them so that in the darkness, people would have enough of something to yearn for. I used to think that my star was there, I said, pointing to the biggest one, sparkling brightly over the horizon. See that? Miro looked up. I used to think that was my lucky star, but that was before I met your sister, I said. I wished Goemi were here. Miro's head was back down again. When all this is over, we will travel all over Akia. There will be no soldiers pursuing us because our great traveling show will be applauded by Akeens. Not even the Emperor himself will be able to stop us from performing. You'll be there. You'll be the most handsome usher in the show. Goami, she'll be performing too. Maybe I'll teach her how to work the sword. And your mama too, you don't have to worry about her. She's good with horses, and the crowd will love her. Everyone is fascinated with beautiful people, especially if they have talent. Your mother has both, I said, smiling kindly at Miro. He had stopped rocking. I could only presume he was listening intently. I love your sister, I said. I know I shouldn't be telling you this, but that moment she unfroze my heart, she started something inside it, a love I knew would captivate me down to my last breath. I am not afraid to tell her I love her because if not for love, what do we have? Although I think she's scared. I don't know why she never told me she loved me back. But I feel like she does, and that's better than hearing the words, I paused. Although hearing her tell me that would be wonderful. But she said, when all this is over, we'll talk. And what have I got to hope for but for her to tell me she loves me back? I smiled again. It was a good promise, right chum? I asked, trying to engage him in conversation. 
I stared fondly at the young man in front of me and wished he was better. That he did not have the wit of a toddler. That he could someday also be fit enough to profess to the woman he would love, and later, marry and have children with. I wished him all that and more. He is family to me now because of his ties to Goemi. Miro glanced up at me, and his eyes met mine. I smiled kindly at him. Everything's going to be all right, I told him. It was better to tell him this when he was staring at me. He had beautiful eyes like Goemi. She told me to tell you she loves you too, Miro said. The unnatural slur of his voice was gone, and my eyes widened in astonishment, glad that he was well. At least for the moment, he was well. Goemi would be delighted. All at once, my heart seared with pain, and I clutched at my chest, panting, breathing hard. My eyelids fluttered, and before my vision blurred, I caught sight of Miro's eyes. He has Goemi's eyes, but there was one big difference, Goemi's never displayed hatred. Then, I twisted as I lost breath. I was. Gone. The Twins I rushed forward, and finally, I found two horses. Thank God for keeping them safe. Miro and Arden were together. Miro was sitting beside Arden. Arden had his back against a tree, his head was leaning sideways and his blonde hair covering the left side of his face. Even sleeping, he looked beautiful. His face had a sickly shade, but once he'd eaten and his wound had healed, he would be well again. I ran towards them, hugged Miro and kissed him on the cheek before crouching in front of Arden. I gazed at his face and touched the hair that fell upon his face. I looked for his hat, but it wasn't around. He probably lost it in the fight. Something seemed so wrong. Arden wasn't moving. When my fingers grazed his cheek, the coldness of his flesh seeped through my fingers. It can't be. Arden? I said, choking. No, no, no. Arden? I grasped his body, and it fell towards me, limp. His face sagged against my shoulder, and I clutched at his head, tearing up inside. Oh my god. Please, please, wake up. I said against his ear, but his head did not move as it should. I pulled back and looked at his face, at his lips that had started to become purple, and hated myself for not telling him I loved him earlier. Three words. Three words and I could not say them to you. I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. Arden, please wake up. I kept on repeating. I brushed his hair up, and it fell again. His eyes, how I longed for them to open. For his blue eyes to gaze upon me. It had only been a few hours ago when they did that. And now. Now. He's gone. I sobbed because I could not restrain them anymore. You're so unfair. Fighting the way you did. If you had not fought and came to us when you should, you would not have gotten that awful wound and would still be with me. I choked upon remembering it was me who called him. It was me he was smiling at right before the sword landed on his shoulder. It was me who should be blamed for his death. I collapsed on the ground, right beside him, and I pulled at his body. He was heavy. Gods, he was heavy. I held him tightly as my tears fell down his face. Miro was watching us. For a moment, our eyes met, then he looked to his right. He lifted his right hand and brushed away the drool from the side of his mouth. There was something about the way he moved tonight that bothered me. Yet, I had no time to dwell on it. Because I only had Arden to think about today. I could not get enough of this young man. How would I ever live without him? The gods must have hated me so much. To bring someone like him into my life only for him to be taken away again. Was there no other power that could bring him back to life? Because if there were, I would set sail across Akia just to bring Arden back, but he lay on my lap unmoving. His right hand dangled limply to his side while his left hand was pressed against his stomach. His long legs sprawled in an awkward position, but I knew he would not mind. They could not go numb anymore because he was gone. When was it? When was that time I realized I loved him? It was right before he went away. That time I ran away from the hut, and he chased after me. That time we were sitting together, and he edged closer to kiss me. Only he had not. Because right before his lips met mine, he had told me, don't let me kiss you if you have no intention of falling in love with me. I panicked and pulled away from him. He'd never know now that I did because I had fallen in love with him, and I was scared. 
I looked at his face again and missed him. His lips would not smile at me anymore. His eyes would not wink at me anymore, and his right hand would not tip the corner of his hat anymore. All those gestures that endeared him to me were gone. With all my heart, I leaned closer to him and kissed him, hoping that his spirit was somewhere near and he could see how important he was to me. I kissed him, hoping that love would be enough to bring him back, but his lips were cold and lifeless, and the memory of this moment, the first time my lips met his, would soon be erased. Mia and Quila came trotting on their horses. They climbed down and pulled at Mayo and Kino. When they saw me, their eyes looked at me questioningly. Mia's eyes widened, and she gasped, covering her mouth with her hand. Quila's eyes widened equally, and she shrieked, piercing the night with the anguish she could not contain inside her chest. I wanted to wail, too, to let the world know what Arden's loss meant to me. But I remained still, clutching at Arden's body. Because I knew that I had limited time with him now. I wanted to make the most of it. Quila ran towards us, and upon reaching us, she grasped Arden's head and started yelling. Arden! Wake up! Wake up! She yelled. When Arden would not move, she asked in a very soft voice that tore at my heart, who's going to call me chum now? Then, she started sobbing. I gazed up, not wanting to watch Quila's pain, and found myself staring at the sky. The stars had gone into hiding, and I could have sworn that even the heavens were bleeding. I brushed my hand against my cheeks to dry my tears, and my gaze fell upon a movement behind the trees. I squinted and tried to see who it was, but all I saw was the silhouette of a woman rushing away. I craned my neck, but she was gone. I did not see her face. Although I did not know her, I worried about her because Sinista was no place for any human, for a woman even more so. Mia Passup Arden's face had lost its color, and his body had started to stiffen. Death had taken its toll on the lad's body. We have to give him the funeral he deserves, I said softly to Goemi. My daughter did not stir. Instead, she kept on clutching Arden's body. I can't bury him here. Can't, she said, shaking her head. The tears had stopped falling through. My heart felt hollow. Let's at least have him lie down. At that, Goemi nodded. So, I crouched down beside her and helped her put Arden down. His wound had stopped bleeding long before the bandage was wrapped, I said, trying to make conversation. The bandage barely had any blood. Goemi stared at the bandage and nodded. She touched the cloth and, with wide eyes, looked at what Arden was wearing. I did not know what she was thinking. Miro, did you tear Arden's clothes? She asked in a shaky voice. Miro still hadn't moved since we arrived. He appeared brooding. In a way, maybe that was how he mourned people if ever he understood what had happened. Goemi walked over to Miro and bent down in front of him. Did you tear off that piece of cloth from Arden's shirt? She asked. Miro nodded slightly. Did you tie the bandage around his shoulder? Goemi asked. At that, Miro stopped rocking for a while and then continued again. Did you tie the bandage around his shoulder? Miro paused before shaking his head. Even in the darkness, I could have sworn that Goemi's face paled. I bent over Arden, studied the bandage wrapping his shoulders, and wondered why Goemi was asking those questions. My eyes widened. The bandage was wrapped neatly. I pushed at Arden so I could see where the end of the dressing had gone. It was inserted behind the back and Arden could not have done that. And if he did not, why would Miro lie about it? Goemi flew into a rage and shouted at Miro. Liar. Then, she stood up. You're a liar. Did you do this to him? Did you? She rushed towards Arden, hands working frantically over his chest. How could you, Miro? How could you? Then, she pressed both hands to Arden's chest and shrieked. I could feel it. The taint that you left behind, she paled and collapsed. I gasped at what Goemi was saying. Did Miro freeze Arden's heart? I turned to look at Miro. Goemi moved over Arden again, and with a fresh batch of tears, she hovered over him, eyes shut tightly as she tried to bring him back to life. But more than an hour had passed, and from what I understood of Miro's power, whatever he touched for more than a few hours could never be revived. So, Arden lay there under the dark sky with his heart frozen. Forever. 
Dogen Ronda. There were only four of us traveling now. Beside me, Manny Ren limped. We looked quite a pair, limping bastards. The other two Nivens were Yu San and Ames, both were not hurt. Not even a scar on their bodies, but not without a cost. My arms were sore from burying the eight Nivens that fell in the fight. It wasn't only my arms that hurt. Most of the damage was actually to my spirit. I groaned loudly without meaning to. We were lucky to get some horses. If I wasn't mistaken, we had at least cut down the general's men to half. We caused enough damage to their pack. The tree runners surprised me. I never thought they would not join us in the battle. After hurting us to where the soldiers were, I thought they would at least help us in our fight. But no, they had disappeared like they did not care whether their so-called little brother would die out here. Craddy asked tree runners. Something bothered me. I thought I caught a glimpse of Lamare. A woman who probably was as short as she was out there fighting. But I had buried her myself, and I could only conclude that my eyes played tricks on me. Did you see her? I asked Van Iren. By her, I meant Piper. She was there. I should have gone after her. The only trouble was, there were too many soldiers, and I had to fight with you. I shook my head. Stubborn girl, I said. But she's brave, isn't she? Nivens have no option but to be brave, Manny Ren started. When you grow up in a place where you are taught that any time someone could come and conquer your land, and outsiders could start killing your people, there's no other choice but to be brave. I felt sorry for the Nivens. It shouldn't have been like that. Girls were expected to play with dolls, and boys to enjoy the pawns. No one should be taught how to use a dagger the moment he or she could crawl. Cretty things happen, and so here we are, Manny Wren said. He frowned. Why don't you ask one of those tree runners if they can lead us to where Piper went? They're a crazy lot. Don't want to have anything to do with them anymore, I said. Cratty bastards leaving us like that. If they had helped us, they. I paused, thinking about all the Nivens that fell, would still be with us. They didn't mean to, Manny Wren replied. I looked behind and found Yusan and Ames trotting. They were not talking to each other. Their faces were long, probably still mourning over their friends' losses. What do you mean? I asked. Tree runners don't fight the human war. They have a lot of honor. Honor. I say they have no honor at all. Can't they see who the bad men were? We were fighting the soldiers. That's all they saw. I groaned. It's not right to run away from war. The least they could have done was to pick a side and fight for that side. Those who could not do so were nothing but cowards who spawned a good excuse to avoid fighting. They chose to save their own lives. I shook my head. It still wasn't right. You know what's not right? Manny Uren said. It's us going around in circles in this place when we could have easily asked the tree runners to help us find the girl. What would you do if when we reach the poor girl, she's already dead? and half of her body is already eaten by hobbubs. It was an ugly picture, but it worked on me. Maybe now's not the time to be so arrogant. Perhaps we needed help from tree runners. All right, I said. Then, I stopped the horse and leapt down to the ground. I put my hands on the ground, willed for the flowers to grow, and waited a few more minutes for the tree runners to appear. Quila Tash I stared at Miro with wide eyes. He could not have. Or did he? Did he really? It was Goemi who was claiming Miro froze Arden's heart. If anyone among us should be defending Miro, it was Goemi, so why was she the one pointing that accusation at Miro? Because it was true. The truth stung me. Arden did not die because of the wound. He was murdered. Before everything sank in, the sounds of hooves surrounded us. Are there any more soldiers? I asked frantically. Nia looked concerned. Help me. She said before she went to Mayo and lifted him up. I pushed at Mayo's butt, grunting. And then, he was on the saddle. I rode behind him and clutched the reins tightly. Go Ami, help me here, Nia said. Go Ami was frozen to the spot. 
Her face was a mask of hesitation. Of pain. And of anger. I can't, she said. I can't leave Arden behind. Nia walked over to her, slapped her on both cheeks, put her hands on Goemi's shoulders and shook her. If we don't leave now, we're as good as dead. Arden's death would be for nothing. Do you want to die here? Then, take his sword and stick it through your guts, Nia was fuming. It seemed to work. Goemi flushed, and then, she all but ran towards Kino. She helped Nia carry Kino to the horse. After that, Nia mounted, too, while Goemi ran back to Arden, kissed him one last time, and grabbed the other horse. She was crying again, and I felt like choking, too. Then, I remembered something. I jumped down from the horse and ran towards Arden. We have to leave now. Quila, get back here. Nia yelled. The sound of hoofs was getting louder and louder. I crouched down over Arden and unbuckled his belt. Then, I stood up as I strapped the belt holding the scabbard around my waist. Before running back to the horse, I unsheathed the sword. The sound the sword made as it brushed against the leather sheath sent chills running all over my body. I will have this, Arden, I said softly. I will remember, I promised. The ruby on the sword's hilt glinted in the night, blinding me momentarily with its sparkle before I put the sword back in the scabbard. Arden was lying on the ground. He looked peaceful like he had not witnessed all the fighting earlier. I bent in front of him, and for the first time, I kissed his cheeks. I dropped kisses on his eyelids too and said goodbye. I ran back to the horse and mounted, but my heart was heavy, knowing it was the last time I would see Arden. There would be no new adventures with him. That moment a while ago when I said goodbye was final. But there was nothing more I could do for him. Burying him would take so much time, and there were soldiers at our heels, all eager to have our heads on pikes. Let's go, I told everyone. Go and me turned to look at Miro. Her stare was so cold that I got scared for her twin. Let's go, she repeated to him. Are we taking him with us? I asked. He's a murderer. If he goes with us, who knows who he'll kill next? What if it's Maya or me? I ranted, rage coursing through my body. Miro stood behind us, barely moving. Goemi's shoulders froze. He is still my brother. He is special. If I don't take him with me, he will become dangerous to everyone else. At least with me, there's something I can do to reverse what he's done, she argued. Yeah. Look how Arden is still dead, I said sarcastically. Then, I felt the sting on my face as Goemi slapped me. I looked up and threw my hands around her neck. Then, I pushed her to the ground, biting, clawing, and hitting her alternately. But Goemi was also hitting me back, and she met every attack with a blow against my face and body. Mayo and Nia came down from their horses and pulled us apart. Tears spilled down my cheeks. Goemi was crying too. Stop it now. Let's go, Nia said. Come on, Miro. Ride that other horse. We leave Sinista together. Then to me, Nia added. Goemi's right. Miro will pose a danger to everyone else if we leave him behind. Miro walked slowly towards the horse and mounted. He kicked at it and turned around, leaving us shocked. Goemi ran to grab a horse and follow her twin. No. Goemi, get back. We can't go after him. The soldiers are right there, Nia said. But Mama. If the soldiers capture him, Miro will find himself surrounded by dead soldiers, Nia said. We must leave now, or else we will risk everyone else. After that, we will look for Miro. Nia kicked at her horse and started galloping the other way. I looked at where Miro disappeared. I hoped we did not run into him again. I wished Arden, and I had never met him. The moment Miro froze Arden's heart was also the same time my heart froze at the idea of possibly holding affection towards Miro. All of us were riding hard now. I turned to look back to the spot where we left Arden. I squinted as a graying girl stood up from beside Arden's corpse. She rubbed her hands against her face as though she had been crying. She looked in the direction where the sound of hooves was coming from. She doubled back and looked at Arden again before mounting the horse. I put my eyes back on the road, hoping Piper would reach us soon. We needed her. We should stand by each other. With Arden lost, I really don't know what will happen now. Or how the silly moons would still manage to bring happiness into my heart. <laughs>